Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. God's given us an auspicious day in which to worship, and we thank him for it, and we appreciate your presence. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. I hope in doing that we're coming up, we can be a real inspiration. Once again, I want to insist upon you getting on your phone out there in the radio listening audience, calling a friend or shut in, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. If you'll do that, you'll be doing them a favor and us as well. As we sing in the Christmas season the song, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. Everyone on the first.
Kind shepherd, feed him in pastures so green. The choir's going to sing a song that I love to hear the ladies sing. I love to hear the little children sing. It says, Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The scars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the way.
Christmas music, praise God for it. We'll have this morning the Blessed Hope Singers to sing a song that says, Thanks for the Blessings. <laughs> Appreciate that. That was done as was recorded by the gospel masters in 1979. And the Lord let us have the privilege to write and copyright that song. And I'd like to dedicate that to y'all and thanking the Lord for the blessings in the Christmas season. The choir has a song that says, Hark the Herald Angels. <coughs>
Blessed Oak Singers would like to do a song that's been recorded down through the years, been beautifully done by quartets and trios, it says, Old Holy Night.
Now we most certainly appreciate the beautiful singing and the music this morning. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to speak on the subject, the babe of Bethlehem. Turn to Luke chapter 2 for the reading of God's word. It's been my privilege to have visited that place where Christ was born some 12 times. Lord willing, we plan to go back again in March of next year. Some of you interested in the tour, get in touch with us. We'll give you a brochure telling you about the tour. Be 10 days over there, eight days in Israel, two days in Geneva, Switzerland. It always thrilled my heart and humble my heart to go down into the stable or the place where Christ was born. I'm looking forward to going back again, the good Lord willing. And maybe some of you might be interested. Maybe some of you in the radio listen audience might want to send you a pastor or your pastor and his wife or maybe a friend. No greater thing you could do than to send them. A couple of years ago, a dear lady called me and said, Preach Evans, my son is saved, but he's not dedicated to God like he ought to be. And I just wondered if I'd send him on this tour, would that help him? I said, Yes, lady, it most certainly would. We carried a young man and his young bride with us over there one year. I only been married a short period of time. God got a hold of his heart and he surrendered to preach. Came back and finished school at Bob Jones University. And uh, he taught there for a while, I believe, and maybe not in the past it, I'm not sure. But the trip to the Holy Land, God used to really get a hold of his heart. And it does wonders for people. That's why we go and that's why we insist it. That's why we like to see others go. Turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read the scriptures in a moment. Now the terrible thing that's happening in Washington is marring the spirit of Christmas in America. The awful confusion, the fight among the Democrats and Republicans and the administration. The terrible, terrible thing. It's sickening and it's going to certainly mar the good spirit at this particular time of the year. And there's a terrible fight on there between the parties. And it's bad. It's certainly bad. And, and uh, I don't see there's all that much involved to cause all that great stir up. Yeah, just like a few days ago, one of the most wicked, I think the most wicked senator in Washington just come back from the Middle East. And he's spreading his lies and propaganda in America about how that People lost confidence in this nation. The president lost his credibility and spreading all kind of lies and propaganda in the nation after coming back from the Middle East, painting a great, a very bad picture in regard to other nations in respect to America. And I think it's a bunch of bald-faced liars. He forgot about the time whenever he ought to have been at home, his wife and young'uns, when he cared a young girl out to a drinking party and carried off and drowned her that night. He forgot about that, the dirty dog. And he wants to tell his lies and spread that propaganda in America. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the most wicked senator in Washington. Pay no attention to the lies he tells about what he saw in the Middle East and things of that type. He's just doing that to try to hurt the president and the Republican Party and administration and whatnot. And so that's the situation in Washington. It's bad. Everybody at other's throats over there, up there, that's a terrible thing. You're going to have to see it and listen to it for weeks and months to come, no doubt. There seem to be no end. And uh, all that big to do over something that I think is ridiculous to make such a big to do about. All right, Luke chapter 2. I hope you'll be here this evening at 6 o'clock. For the cantata, I know you'll enjoy it. Brother Tony has done a wonderful job in directing these. He did a wonderful job in the Grace Baptist Church last night. He'll be doing a good job here this evening. And I want you to call your friends and have them to come in for this special occasion. Luke chapter 2, page 1073. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. 
And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, out of the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is called Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. All they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorified and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as was told unto them. Now that's reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. The message and the music, the singing today, will be on tape 260. Tape number 260, The Babe of Bethlehem. You can write in and get this tape for a gift of $3 to be used in our radio expense. You can also get a list of our tape. We'll send you a list of 250. We'll also send you the beautiful calendar that we have. If you don't have the calendar, you should write in and get your calendar one or more, however you want. And uh, request the Holy Land brochure if you desire. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. speaks of in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a very beautiful, clean, neat little town. I think I love it ab above any town over there with the exception of Jerusalem. And it's very beautiful. And I've been there many times. And the babe of Bethlehem shows the faithfulness of God. The babe of Bethlehem shows the faithfulness of God. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that came to pass. That babe in, the, in Bethlehem there proves and shows that God is faithful, that God will do what he said he would do. About 712 years later, it happened after God predicted that through Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. We find Isaiah cried concerning the babe. He is the rock of ages. Haggai said he is the desire of all nations. Solomon said he's the rose of Sharon. He's the altogether lovely one. Zechariah said he's king of all the earth. The angel said he is a savior. John the Baptist said he's the lamb of God. Paul said he's the Lord of glory. Peter said he's the prince of life. John said he's the word of God. And the father said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Number two, the babe of Bethlehem shows a knowledge of God. Here God planned a way before he created the earth. And he planned a way to send his son down to the earth. That his son might bring about redemption through his shed blood on Calvary. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit planned this. This is the knowledge of God. That God would be incarnate in the flesh. That God would come down from heaven in the form of a little child and take on 
human flesh. And that he did. That was the plan of God. Now there's three reasons why that he was born in Bethlehem. Reason number one, to fulfill prophecy. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the Bible tells us there, said, Behold thou Bethlehem Ephratar, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruled in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so he was born in Bethlehem to fulfill that prophecy by Haggai the prophet, or rather Micah the prophet. And then the second reason he was born in Bethlehem is because David was born there. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1, David the great king was born in Bethlehem. Remember Jesus, Mary and Joseph came from Nazareth with him before he was born and of course, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. And then thirdly, Bethlehem means the house of bread. What better place could he be born than in Bethlehem because it means the house of bread. And the word of God tells us he is that bread of life and how true that is. If you have eaten that bread, you shall live forever. If you have eaten the bread of life, you'll never die. So saith the word of God. Jesus said, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. But he said, if you eat this bread, I shall give you, ye shall never die. And that bread is Jesus Christ himself. Number three, the babe of Bethlehem teaches us how to celebrate Christmas. People today go wild at Christmas time and, and many uh, phases and activities of life. They don't know how to celebrate Christmas. Only real, true Christians can really appreciate uh, the Christmas season. Now, the Christmas season is a season of time that's uplifted. It's a time of the year when the weather begins to get cool. The leaves fall off the trees and everything seems to be dead and dying. And then all of a sudden, there's a brightness comes on the scene over the nation. And that brightness is Christmas time. People begin to light up and fix up and buy gifts and give gifts and show love and appreciation as a great uplifter. It's a great thing, a great uplift at this particular time of the year. And then when Christmas time fades away, you begin to look forward to another year and plan your activities for the coming year. And you take courage and dig in to start on another year in January. And so Christmas comes at a good time, and people need to learn how to worship Christmas. That's one of these society sisters in a store buying a few things, and she overheard some uh, people that loved God talking about Jesus at Christmas time, and she said to the lady with her, said, do you hear that? While wow, those stupid people are trying to drag Jesus Christ into Christmas. Isn't that terrible? Why wow, the poor ignorant woman didn't know what it was all about. If you leave Jesus Christ out of Christmas, you don't have any Christmas. Because he's the center of Christmas. And because of his birth is the reason we celebrate Christmas time. Should be uplifting. And we don't know the exact moment he was born or the day, but we know he was born. We thank God for that. And then we can worship Christmas by seeing the wonderful things that God has done. That's the way to celebrate Christmas. See the wonderful things that God has done. In Luke chapter 2 verses 15 and 16. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. Which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary, Joseph, the babe lying in a manger. These shepherds said let's go see the wonderful thing that God has done. That's the way to celebrate Christmas. Look around you. And see the wonderful things that God has done. Secondly, by telling what the Lord has done. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning uh, the child. So they went about telling it. You need to tell it. Tell about Jesus. Tell about his birth at Christmas time. That's the way to celebrate Christmas. A lot of the week today and and dear people that are blinded and lost and on the road to hell, they think the way to celebrate Christmas is buy up some booze or beer or wine and liquor and get ready to celebrate. That's not the way to celebrate Christmas. Should not be celebrated that man and cannot be. 
Now you need to tell people why you're celebrating Christmas. And that is pertaining to the child that's been born. And then number three, by marveling at the things of God. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2 and verse 18, And all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Those shepherds began to tell the news around. And people marveled. They wondered. They said, did you hear what those shepherds are telling around here? Did you hear what they said they saw? And they marveled at the message sent forth from the shepherds. And then, beloved, you celebrate Christmas by meditating on the wonderful things of God. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 19, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Everything the angel told her about her conception and the birth of Christ, she pondered those things in her heart. She did not let them get away from her. She thought about them in the day. She thought about them during the night. And she wondered about them and pondered them in her heart. Now you need to meditate upon the things of God. Assimilate the word of God. Cogentate upon what you learn about the birth of Jesus. Don't forget it. And always remember that. Meditate upon the word of God. That's the way to celebrate Christmas. Number five is by praising and glorifying God for the things he's done. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 20, And the shepherds returned glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. They didn't keep quiet. The Bible said when they went and saw the babe there in Bethlehem, that they went about praising God and glorifying God and rejoicing and telling everybody and they had praise on their lips and joy in their heart and they glorified God. That's the way to celebrate Christmas. You want to celebrate Christmas? Praise the Lord. Sing the beautiful hymns and the carols about Christmas and let people know why you're happy and why you thank the Lord for what He's done. And so that's the five ways in which to celebrate Christmas. Number four, the babe of Bethlehem shows us the real genuine love of God. If you want to really see the love of God, look at the babe of Bethlehem. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, that's the love of God. Bethlehem speaks the love of God. The love of God speaks of giving. We should give. We should give ourselves to God. Give up our sins, give up our bad habits, and give gifts to the glory of God. We need to do that. We find in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that there we find God the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest invitation believes the greatest simplicity, in him the greatest person, should not perish the greatest deliverance, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. That's John 3, 16. God so loved that he gave. And then what the wise men gave when they came to visit Jesus, there when they paid him a visit, these wise men from the east. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. These wise men from the east came a long way. Probably from way over around Iraq or uh, Saudi Arabia. Came from that direction. And came all the way across over into Bethlehem. There to see the child Jesus. Because they saw his star in the east. They knew something unusual happened. And these wise men came. It took them several days to get there, but they arrived on the scene. And when they came, they brought three different kinds of gifts. The Bible said they brought gold, they brought frankincense, and they brought myrrh. Now, why did they bring gold? Why did they bring uh, frankincense? Why did they bring myrrh? For a reason. Number one, gold is uh, speaks of deity. That gift they gave there speaks of the deity of the Son of God. 
When they laid that gold down at that baby's feet, that meant he's God. That is very deity. That's God in the flesh. In due time, in fullness of time, he came born of a woman. That is very God. Isaiah said he is God with us. So they laid the gold down, which speaks of God, his deity. Then secondly, laid down frankincense. Frankincense speaks of Christ the priest and speaks of Christ his humanity. Not only was he deity, but he was God in flesh and came in tabernacle in humanity. And the frankincense speaks of humanity that Jesus lived in a body God provided for him upon the earth. A body has now provided for me, O God, he said in the book of Hebrews. So here the frankincense speaks of his humanity. He was human to that extent. He was the God man. He was very God and he was very man. Great is the mystery of godliness that Jesus came born of a, a, a man born of woman upon the earth, tabernacle in the flesh, seen of angels. That's a great mystery. And that uh, frankincense speaks of his, his human, human body. And then it speaks of his priesthood. Jesus was very God. He was prophet, priest, and king. And he's now at the right hand of the Father as our advocate, as our great high priest at the right hand of God in heaven. That frankincense speaks of the priesthood and humanity of Christ. But there's something else those wise men brought. The Bible said they were wise men. Why did they bring these particular items? Well, there's a reason for it. I'm telling you why. Number three, mercy speaks of the anointing of Christ for sacrifice. It speaks of death and embalmment. When they brought the mercy, that speaks of the very death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross when you hang between heaven and earth and said it is finished and those three gifts speaks of his, his deity his life on earth and his death on Calvary and he was buried and rose again after three days and three nights later sent him back to heaven now waiting to come again and so the wise men the wise men brought these three gifts and they were gifts of wisdom that they brought from Saudi Arabia all the way across over to the little town of Bethlehem. How wonderful. Then we come to thought number five, and that is the babe of Bethlehem brings a message of salvation. See, salvation is in a person. Salvation is not in church membership. Salvation is not in water baptism. Salvation is not in observing the Lord's Supper. Salvation is not in good deeds, good morality. Salvation is not in good works. Salvation is in a person. You must remember that. He came and brought a message of salvation, a message of the forgiveness of sins, the message of regeneration, a new life, a message of cleansing, and a message of hope. If you are saved, you have salvation. Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you have the Savior, then you have salvation. If you have not the Savior, you're lost. I don't care how many good deeds you've done, how many churches you're affiliated with, how kind you may have been, how many good works that you may have ministered. If you are not saved, you're still lost. And the only way you can have salvation is take God's salvation, the babe that was in the manger, who died on a cross and now at the right hand of God. That leads us to thought number six. The babe of Bethlehem brings a message of peace and goodwill. Now the world out here doesn't have peace with God. Why is it so many people commit suicide? Why is it our young people, they get on dope and commit suicide? Why is it wealthy people and, and popular people and, and uh, what they call movie stars, when they begin to lose their attraction, commit suicide? Why? Why do they do that? They don't have the peace of God. Why is it people drink their liquor, their beer, and their wine, drive up and down the highways at breakneck speed? They don't have the peace of God. Why do they go out and commit these crimes and sins and evil? They don't have the peace of God. And the only way you can have the peace of God is by faith in Jesus Christ. That is peace with God. The Bible said the carnal mind 
is in enmity with God and not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And you can have peace with God by coming to God, repenting of your sins, by faith in Him and making an unconditional surrender. When you make an unconditional surrender, that means God takes over. During the war in Germany, during the latter part of the war, we'd hear rumors the war was about to end. And then the Germans would try to make some kind of peace and meet with the peacemakers that they might keep some of their territory. But the word came from our president, no sir, that's nothing short of absolutely complete unconditional surrender. You just surrender, we take over completely, and we'll tell you what you can do after that. And they stuck by that until eventually they had to completely surrender unconditionally in order to stop the war, and that they did. Now that's the only way you can have peace with God. Every sinner is fighting against God. You got to come unconditionally surrendering to God. Then you can have the peace of God in your heart. You'll never have the peace of God in your heart until you have peace with God. Then God gives you that peace. Everybody talking about peace. Even the Russians talk about peace. What they talk about, they want to get a peace here and a peace there and a peace yonder and a peace on the other side of the globe and a peace over there until they have the whole world. That's the kind of peace they're talking about. Other people want peace, but everybody wants the biggest peace. Now God can give you that peace. And then you can have peace with your fellow man as far as possible. The Bible says, for as much in your ears live peace with all men. There are some people on the earth you can't live peacefully with. But as far as possible, then do so. Then finally, number seven, the babe of Bethlehem brings a message of coming glory. Now you listen to this, would you please? A message of coming glory. Now the Bible lets us know he's a star out of Jacob. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, I shall see him but now, I shall behold him but not now, there shall come a star out of Jacob. That's what the wise men saw. They saw a star, the star out of Jacob, and they followed that star. And that was literally and minutely fulfilled when they came to worship Jesus. Number two, there's the star of Bethlehem. They're in the church that at the, where they have the place, the place of nativity they have a, a big star and you can see that star there's a star of Bethlehem that was there that day those wise men came and that star came right over Bethlehem where Jesus abode at that time and then there is the bright and morning star now just before day every morning when the weather is clear you can see a star a little larger than the other stars that comes when the night is the darkest, and that's called the bright and morning star. Now, Jesus said, I am the bright and the morning star. What does it mean by that? That's the rapture. When you see the bright and morning star, that reminds you of the coming rapture, when Jesus will come to lift his people off the face of the earth. We're to be looking for the bright and morning star. Thank God for the babe in Bethlehem. I'm glad he was born there about 2,000 years ago. I'm glad I became acquainted with him and know him as my Savior. Let me give you this little Christmas story. I've given it before, but it's so fitting. I like to give it at Christmas time. And it is a true story. Many years ago, in a cold uh, prison yonder in one of the northern cities, there was a criminal sitting there that committed a crime. He left a wife and a little girl and a little boy at home. He was sitting there, a hardened criminal, and the chaplain went in to speak that morning, and the warden sitting there said, uh, said, you see that man sitting out there, look like a hardened criminal? He said, yes, I do. He said, I, I, got, I want to tell you about him after the service here this morning. After the service, the warden said to the chaplain, he said, here, not too long ago, said, early one Christmas morning before day, I left the prison here, I started home to be with my family. And I saw standing at the corner of the prison, beside those dark gray walls in the darkness of the night, a little girl. She had on just a little thin dress and barefooted and no coat. And it was cold and she was crying. And she had a little piece of paper in her hand. I said to her, I said, little girl, what are you doing out here? She said, mister, are you the warden? He said, yes. 
Uh, he said, what are you doing out here? And she said, my dad is in there. And said, mama died and little brother died and I'm the only one left. And said, I want to bring my daddy a little Christmas present. Oh, he said, little girl, you can't do that. You must go home. She said, Mr. Warden, if you were in that prison and you had a little daughter and she wanted to come to see you on Christmas, would you not let her come in to see you? Would you like for her to come in to see you? And the old one began to cry. He said, well, honey, I guess I would like for my little daughter to come in if I were in your place, in the place of your dad. He took that little girl by the hand. He led her into that cold, dark, damp prison. He carried her toward her father. And when the father saw him come, and he said, Nelly, Nelly, what are you doing in here? You have no business in here. The warden came down and said, Sir, she wants to talk with you. The old man began to tremble. And he was kind of harsh toward his daughter. What are you doing here, said he. She began to cry. She said, Daddy, I brought you a little Christmas present. Said, Daddy, Mama died not long ago. And said, Daddy, little brother died. Said, you know, little brother had beautiful golden curly hair. And Daddy, I just took the scissors and cut off a little of that curly hair. And I put it in this paper, Daddy. That's the only thing I know to bring you for Christmas. I'm going to bring you a portion of little brother's hair. That old man took that paper. He unraveled it. He saw that golden curl. And he broke down and wept like a baby. His heart was touched. Years passed by. That same chaplain went back to that prison. The old man wasn't there. The chaplain said to the warden, Where's the old man that received the little Christmas bread? He said, I'll show you after the service. After the service, they went down the street for many, many blocks. Knocked on the door. There came the door a beautiful, lovely young girl that had become grown at this time. Beautiful girl. There came walking behind an old man with stooped shoulders. There was her daddy. He had been a model, model prisoner after that occasion. Built a little more time and they let him out. And he went to be with his daughter. She grew up and she was keeping house for old daddy in his old days. She's a fine Christian young girl. All because she loved God and loved her daddy and went to do something about it on that Christmas day. <clears throat> That's the Christmas spirit, doing something for others. Beloved, it's not what you receive yourself, it's what you do for others. Never complain if you don't get what you think you ought to get. Just rejoice because you can give something to help others out along the way. That's exactly what Christmas is all about. Thank God for the babe of Bethlehem. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and that you'll use it. Thank you for the babe of Bethlehem and what it means to our hearts. God, speak to thy people today in this auditorium, out in the radio listen audience. Lord, be real. Speak to somebody's heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. David's going to play a stanza or so of some imitation song before they sing. That's what we're getting together on. If you're here and you need to come forward for any reason, just come right on, would you? If you need to get saved, to come back to God, to join the church, just come right on while God is speaking. She's going to play through a stanza. Tony's here to help you. I'm here to help you. We'd be glad to help you. Come if you will. <clears throat> 